Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we'll be focusing on a recent book by Laura Robson entitled The Politics of Mass Violence in the Middle East, published by Oxford University Press. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University, co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague, Christian Osterman of the Woodrow Wilson Center. The Washington History Seminar is a collaborative venture of the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for over the past decade, we have been meeting weekly, usually on Mondays, in pre-COVID times at the Wilson Center since pandemic restrictions here in the virtual realm. And today's session, I should note, uh, is being co-sponsored by the Wilson Center's Middle East Program. Behind the scenes are two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And we'd like to thank our two institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University Department of History, as well as a number of uh, donors, anonymous and not anonymous. We invite you as always to join their ranks. On the logistics front, please note today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the Q&A section of this webinar, we ask those with questions to use the raise hand function on the Q or uh, the uh, Q&A function on Zoom. To those watching on Facebook Live, you can email questions to Rachel Wheatley, whose email address is posted in the chat function. And we'll call on as many people as we can. And with that, I turn the screen over to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian, Zoom room is yours. Thanks, Eric. Delighted to uh, moderate this uh, discussion today with Laura Robson, Leila Parsons, and Osama Makdisi. Let me introduce them uh, in turn. We'll start with Laura, the author of the book uh, that we'll be discussing here today. Laura Robson is the Oliver McCourtney Professor of History at Penn State University. She received her PhD from Yale University and is the author and editor of several books including States of Separation, Transfer, Petition, and the Making of the Modern, Modern Middle East, published in 2017, which explores the history of forced migration, population exchange, and refugee resettlement in Iraq, Syria, and Palestine during the interwar period. And then the edited volume, Partitions, a Transnational History of the 20th Century Territorial Separatism, co-edited with Arya Dabnov, uh, published by Stanford in 2019, which examines the emergence and consequences of the political solution of partition in the 20th century world. Her latest book on the discussion today is The Politics of Mass Violence in the Middle East, published last year by Oxford University Press. Laura, the Zoom room is yours. Welcome to the Washington History Seminar. Thank you so much to Eric and Christian for those very kind and generous introductions, and especially to Leila and Sama for agreeing to come and um, speak today. I'm really beyond delighted to be here. Thank you for having me, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. So I thought I would introduce the book by talking a little bit about some of its intellectual premises, and I'm going to begin by highlighting the quote that I've used to open the book. It comes from the Syrian political philosopher Michel Aplak, who was writing in, in 1940, and it addresses the nature of violence. Aflaq said, quote, when we are cruel to others, we know that our cruelty is meant to bring them back to their true selves, of which they are ignorant. So in making this argument that political violence had a purpose, Aflaq was reflecting the thought of other mid-century anti-colonial thinkers, most famously, but not only, Frantz Fanon, whose famous 1963 text, The Wretched of the Earth, depicted anti-colonial violence in particular, both as a kind of cathartic force and as a practical strategy for post-colonial nation building. The reason that I wanted to start here with these thinkers is that their premise is an important one that we too often fail to recognize. Writers and thinkers like Aflaq and Fennel understood something centrally important, I think, about the phenomenon of 20th century violence. And that is 
that it wasn't some kind of atavistic impulse or a sign of some sort of societal breakdown, but rather an active and conscious and deliberate strategy. So not necessarily an ideological commitment, but certainly a kind of tool, one that could be turned to a wide variety of specific political ends. So I think that we need to say this because this is not how the phenomenon of violence is usually understood and particularly with regard to the Middle East. Certainly in the public sphere, but I think even among historians, violence is more often understood as something uncontrolled, a kind of surfacing of varied tensions. So we have a very common practice among popular commentators of regarding it as a more or less inevitable expression of what they see as longstanding and maybe even kind of permanent sectarian or ethnic or national divides in the Middle East. Academic historians of the Middle East, by contrast, have tended to treat mass, modern mass violence as a kind of occasional symptom of a broader social or economic malaise, for instance, the tensions arising from new forms of modern globalization. So the first of these models, which views violence as a kind of inevitable expression of atavistic difference, is not just inadequate, but actively wrong. And many, many scholars, including the two other historians on this panel, have spent a lot of time and energy over the last few decades debunking these myths of longstanding sectarian hatred across the Arab Middle East. The second approach, I think, although it has been hugely useful for understanding particular and specific local histories, has also left unanswered some pretty major questions about how violence came to be such a pervasive feature of the 20th century Maastricht, um, by which I mean the Arabic speaking Eastern Mediterranean, across national borders, across regimes, and across quite long spans of time. So I wanted to think about this question of how should we then understand the history of mass violence in the Middle East? You might think that we could turn to the field of genocide studies, which could be expected to offer some models for how to think about the place and the practice of violence in modern societies, but it's actually had very little to offer here. Why is that? Well, I think that for genocide studies scholars, the question of which instances of mass violence count as genocide has become the central core issue of the field in ways that have really limited its capacity to deal with broader questions of mass violence. The European historians Donald Bloxham and Mark Levine, who founded the series in which this book is published, have sort of skewered this approach. And I want to quote them to illustrate the point. They say, quote, the near obsession with questions of definition in genocide has served to bolster an implicit moral hierarchy of mass violence in which anything not qualifying as genocide is downplayed. This has had a knock-on effect in terms of historical understanding with instances of outright genocide being accorded more attention than other related phenomena, and more importantly, being extracted from historical contexts in which other instances of, quote, lesser violence are intrinsic to the picture, end quote. So they are saying, and this book agrees, that genocide studies, which has been kind of stuck in the frame of regarding legally defined genocides as fundamentally different from and separate from other instances of mass violence, has had very little to offer vis-a-vis -vis the modern Middle East. And Middle Eastern history itself has had its own limitations with regard to broad analytical questions like the history of mass violence. In particular, it has long been committed to profoundly nationalist frames of reference. And that's a situation that it shares with other post-colonial spaces and that can probably be attributed to a kind of reflexive defense of post-colonial nation states that are facing profound challenges. So it's a focus that in many ways is understandable, but it has too often prevented scholars from seeing patterns of political structure and encounters that extend across national borders. And that's particularly true, I think, across the borders of Palestine-Israel, which is nearly always regarded as a kind of sui generis story 
So by taking a frame of mass violence and applying it to this broad regional context in this book, I was hoping to do two things. First, to reintegrate some of these kind of separate narratives that have made up the field of Middle Eastern history in the modern era. And second, to try to expand our understanding of the phenomenon of mass violence beyond these strictly legal definitions of genocide. So those are some of the main kind of intellectual premises of the project, the places I was starting from in terms of the historiography. And before I turn the floor over to the other commentators, I thought I would also just briefly give you a sense of what I think the most important broad conclusions of the book are and how they might change our understanding of both the phenomenon of mass violence itself and the modern history of the metric. So above all, I think this book is about empire. It traces how the experience of modern empire served to install state-sanctioned violence and particularly ethnically or communally conscious violence at the heart of practices of governance across the modern Middle East in ways that have proven to be very difficult and perhaps impossible to reverse. I'm going to just briefly trace my argument as it unfolds in three different imperial settings in chronological order. First in the late Ottoman state as it was challenged by expansionist European empires. Then in the era of direct European colonial rule over the Mashrik in the interwar period. And then in the period of superpower imperialism after 1945. Hmm. So the book makes the argument that this process began in the late 19th century, as the late Ottoman Empire was forced by various European threats to try to take tighter control over its territory. In kind of general terms, this is a moment that marked the beginning of the end for what had previously been a relatively loose and locally flexible form of Ottoman rule, as the imperial government now began to deploy new kinds of force and new levels of force to assert a newly kind of saturated power um, over its land. But also because of the specific nature of the European threat, which took the form typically of identifying client communities who are often Ottoman Christian communities as venues for European intervention in Ottoman affairs, this more vigorous Ottoman approach to rule also now started to display an ethnographic use of force within its own sphere. So this is my first conclusion in the book, that in the late 19th and early 20th century, Ottoman state power against other states began to be demonstrated and exercised internally against communities that it saw as identified with particular European interests. So this, I think, is how the stage was set for a very specific and eventually extremely toxic modern relationship between the premise of state authority and the use of ethnically aware violence in the Ottoman Arab realms. Then we move on to the European colonial period, which begins at the end of the First World War and ends kind of depending on where you are in the 1940s or 1950s. And this is a period for which the concept of mass violence is extremely useful because the historiography of genocide, or for that matter, the historiography of European empire or of the Middle East has never ever truly recognized how brutal European colonialism in the Middle East really was. And it's, it's interesting because the question of colonial violence and its relationship to genocide has come up quite a lot really in other contexts, in places like Australia, in North America, in other, in other places across the globe. But historians haven't really truly come to terms with the bloody nature of the so-called mandate system. Between the 1920s and the 1940s, both the British and French colonial states engaged in truly astonishing levels of violence against civilians all over the Mashrik, bombing villages in Iraq, leveling the entire old city of Damascus, executing and assassinating intellectual and political leaders, bulldozing neighborhoods, murdering children, all accompanied 
by schemes that rigorously and violently segregated populations by ethnicity, by language, and of course, by religion. And I think partly because the British and the French did all of this while claiming to be training these populations for future democratic self-determination, we haven't really internalized the level of destruction of these colonial occupations. We haven't tried to relate it to the violence unfolding in Europe or to colonial violence elsewhere in the same moment. We haven't seen it as a part of a pattern of mass violence that is closely related to the genocidal impulses of late European imperial politics. Instead, we viewed it as something particular to the Middle East and especially to the Zionist Arab conflict that was growing in Palestine. So the second one of my major takeaways here is that we need to recognize the incredible brutality of this interwar occupation of the Middle East and understand it as a crucial part of the global mass destruction of this moment and see it as a period of the more or less permanent installation of the idea that viable state governance rested above all on displays of force. The more brutal, the better. So finally, the book also suggests that we need a reconsideration of the whole of the post-1945 period, which is an era in which both authoritarian and semi-democratic governments across the region engaged in massive arms acquisition and then deployed many, and in some cases, even most of those weapons against sectors of their own populations. We've usually seen this as a process of violent decolonization and then an equally violent kind of post-colonial descent into either authoritarianism or sort of fractured and partial forms of democracy, which is a pattern that we can of course identify in other parts of the world as well. But actually, when we look through this lens of mass violence, I think we can see that there are many ways in which this is not a period of decolonization at all. It's a period of recolonization, of recasting and reshaping empire into new shapes in which superpowers control spaces by combining economic dominance with a deliberate flooding of weaponry into the relevant territories alongside the careful and sometimes not so careful creation of specific ethnic or sectarian client populations. So in truth, I don't think it's too much to say that when we look at the hard realities of power, the Middle East today is as colonized as it has ever been, and that mass violence has been crucial to that enterprise of recolonization, both as a practical strategy and as a political legitimization. So those are some of my own takeaways from the project. And of course, they are very, very far from the last word on the subject. And my real hope for this book is that it will open up a new set of conversations around the role that violence has played in the creation of the modern Middle East. And I'm very much looking forward to hearing the thoughts and the questions of our commentators and audience. So thank you so much. Thanks so much, Laura, terrific. Um, before I introduce our uh, first uh, distinguished commentator, let me um, remind our audience that you can intervene in this discussion in three ways. You can um, use the raised hand function, raise hand function and the Zoom functionality. Um, and you can start doing that now and get in line now with your question. You can use the Q&A um, function up on the, on the top um, of the Zoom screen and um, post your question and I will share it with the panelists. And you can, if you're following us on Facebook Live, you can email your question to Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. Now, uh, on to our um, two distinguished panelists. The first one, Dr. Osama Makdisi, is professor of history and the first holder of the Arab American Educational Foundation Chair of Arab Studies at Rice University. Osama was awarded the Berlin Prize and spent the spring 2018 semester as a fellow at the American Academy of Berlin, where we had the great pleasure to, to, to meet. Um, Professor Magdisi's most recent book, the one that he wrote there, or at least in part, Age of Coexistence, the Ecumenical Frame and the Making of the Modern Arab World, was published 
in 2019 by the University of California Press. He is also, also the author of Faith, Faith Misplaced, The Broken Promise of U.S.-Arab Relations, 1820 to 2001, published in 2010. His previous books include Artillery of Heaven, American Missionaries and the Failed Conversion of the Middle East, published in 2008, which was the winner of the 2008 Albert Hurani Book Award from the Middle East Studies Association and the 2009 Hope Franklin a John Hope Franklin Prize of the American Studies Association. Uh, Dr. Magdisi has published widely on Ottoman and Arab history, as well as on US-Arab relations and US, US missionary work in the Middle East, writing articles that have appeared in the Journal of American History, International Journal of Middle East Studies, Comparative Studies and Society of History, and the Middle East Report. It's a great pleasure, Osama, to uh, see you again and welcome you to the Washington History Seminar. Uh, the Zoom room is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Christian, and thank you uh, to uh, my co-panelists and, of course, to uh, the organizers and, above all, to Laura Robson. Uh, Robson, congratulations, of course, on, on the book. And thank you for uh, asking me to comment on this book. Uh, so Professor Laura Robson's new book, um, The Politics of Mass Violence in the Middle East, uses, as we just heard, a, a conceptual lens of mass violence and a notion of territoriality to narrate the political history of the modern Middle East, uh, at least the Mashriqi part of it. And much to her credit, uh, Robson is, or Laura, if I may, is unsparing in her criticisms of various state brutalities, whether carried out by the late Ottoman uh, Empire, by European colonial powers, by various post-colonial states in the region, including the ones we are most familiar with, the Ba'athist states of Iraq and Syria, as well as a settler colonial state of Israel or uh, ongoing US imperialism in the region. And, and Laura's comments that we just heard reinforced the, this, the thrust of this book. So uh, Laura uh, Robson provides, uh, it seems to me, an extremely clear narrative uh, of this violence with the crucial message that you just reiterated to us now that this violence and the sectarianism that it has engendered uh, are neither primitive nor primordial uh, to the region, but in fact are modern and constructed. And she stresses, again to her credit, that Western imperial powers have had a massive role to play in inculcating and normalizing this violence. Uh, Robson, in short, is addressing those Western academics and lay people who still think, and, and, and many more than we actually think, uh, that the Middle East is inhabited by age-old sectarian feuds and hatreds, by primordial allegiances, by medievalized religions that are pitted against the allegedly tolerant and secular West or the United States, the so-called clash of civilizations. To this audience, uh, Laura's new book offers, it seems to me, a necessary history of what she just told us about, Western colonial violence and its post-colonial ramifications and post-colonial here are in quotation marks as Laura just told us this world is still not in, in any proper sense decolonized. Uh, this is a story largely uh, as Laura narrates it of British um, and then US as well as French colonial domination of the region that transformed what was once an Ottoman whole into what it is today at least what it is today to consumers of the Middle East outside the Middle East, an arena of what Robeson describes aptly as a quote, dystopian, uh, a region of dystopian politics of identity that is also the scene of a massive and ongoing US military um, imperial presence or grip uh, in the afterglow of the catastrophic illegal US invasion and occupation of Iraq in 2003. So Robson's book is a frank reminder of a series of overt and covert and equally insidious Western fragmentation and sectarianization of this region, of the modern Mashriq, the Levant. I am, of course, in total agreement with Professor Robson that the people of the Middle East, of whatever sect or ethnicity, are not inherently violent or sectarian. But I am, uh, this is where my sort of, I guess, my, my, my constructive reactions to Laura's book um, and they have to be understood exactly as that, as, as a response to what I see as a, as a uh, powerfully provocative book. I'm a little apprehensive about a book that takes uh, 
what is that heart? Uh, uh, what that takes? What is the heart of the modern Western relationship to the Middle East? That is to say, violence and racism and the exploitation of people and resources, and transforms it, inadvertently perhaps, but relentlessly, chapter by chapter, to the point that by the end of the book, violence seems to be uh, the pathos of the region, or what Rose, Robson or Robson describes as the quote intractable zone of violence in this region. How, I wonder, can an account of violent politics be studied or analyzed or narrated independently of ideology, of accounting for powerful and sustained countervailing currents, of ecumenical lives and dreams, of a profound anti-sectarian culture that has been so evident in the mashriq in its broadest and most humane sense, all of which makes the modern Arab world and the mashriq a living, real, meaningful place that is identifiable to its own people. Indeed, why mass violence and territoriality as the conceptual lenses and not those most familiar to the people of the region and its own intellectuals? That is to say, colonialism and nationalism and citizenship. These are, of course, all questions that, that Robson deals with uh, in different ways because she is far at her strongest and most concise and most eloquent uh, uh, when she's covering the material uh, and the sources that she's analyzed in great depth the British Empire and its colonial violence, and especially the harrowing accounts of, for example, Churchill's racist and enthusiastic embrace of the use of poison gas on so-called uncivilized people uh, in Iraq, or the sadistic and racist British regime of torture to crush the Palestinian uh, revolution in 1936. You know, and, and she describes these in quite great detail uh, and very powerfully and very harrowingly uh, in page 81. And this echoes, I think, her first book, her first really excellent book, um, where she again reiterates here the idea that this Western colonial presence was, was about, quote, destroying institutions and imposing sectarianism that profoundly scarred the political culture of the colonized and post-colonial mashriq, if indeed, as, as, as Robson correctly noted, the, the mashriq really is decolonized given the massive US presence. In, in fact, many of the key dates of, of Robson's book, 1920, 1932, 1948, 1956, 1967, 1982, and 2003, are all dates in which Western and Israeli colonial power have played key roles. So the point is, and I agree here entirely with Laura, is not to deny that the region um, has been subjected to different regimes of violence, but what to make of these different regimes and quite different uh, what Robeson describes uh, as national visions of post-colonial viability. Uh, the problem, in other words, is that by focusing only on violence, we have little sense of why violence has unfolded on the specific part of specific Arabs and Kurds, except as a broad suggestion that they are collectively invested or made to be invested in a politics of exclusionary nationalism that relentlessly obliterates difference, suppresses dissent, and smashes opposition. That may indeed be well one aspect of uh, current or contemporary political culture of the mashriq, and I agree with Robson that that is an one aspect of, of obviously of politics in this region in the 20th century, and, and it's one that that Robson that Laura is writing very powerfully against, and I'm in total agreement with her on that point. But it seems to me that there is that that there is so much more that we need to make the story comprehensible to those whom Robson is trying to convince that the Middle East is not simply an endless repetition of sectarianism. My point, in other words, to be as clear as possible, is that it's one thing to criticize and to excoriate, as, as Robson does so vividly and powerfully, Winston Churchill and Robert Duquet and other malign racist colonizers and imperialists, uh, because her Western audience presumably knows that the West is not simply colonialism and racism and imperialism, but many other things besides. In the colonized and post-colonial Arab case, however, we are presented with episodes of nationalist political violence without any substantial discussion of political culture. So we have political culture without schools, without dreams, without fantasies, without art, without people in any complex form that might have reminded readers of some of their concerns, their writings, their imaginations, their ideologies, or their theorizations of their own political condition. So I, of course, I understand that Laura's book here is, is focused on violence and on mass violence, as she says very eloquently. Uh, but, and inevitably in any book of, of, of this nature, there's going to be some compression. But it seems to me that 
at some level, there, there is the compression uh, leads to a conflation of, of very different experiences. For example, when Laura is, she's absolutely correct in talking about the Armenian genocide as a culmination of a destructive and novel ethno-religious politics that consumed the Ottoman Balkans and Anatolia after 1878, and more specifically after 1913. Um, and not totally and never completely, but certainly devastatingly as far as, as the Armenians were concerned and the Greeks. Uh, but Robeson and, and, and other Christians, but Robeson, it seems to me, glosses the key point that the Ottoman Mashriq region, which was predominantly Arab, was not the setting of such competing ethno-religious nationalisms. And that Arab Christians and to an extent Arab Jews played a major and well-known and well-documented role in the Arab Mahda or Renaissance which was, if nothing else, profoundly ecumenical. The irony here is that the Arab Christians in Palestine, Egypt, Syria, Lebanon uh, thrived in the late Ottoman period at the same time as Armenian Christians were steadily and systematically made into an unwanted minority in what Laura correctly describes as the Turkish dominated CUP, uh, which clearly identified uh, the Ottoman, the late empire as a Muslim majority state that had to be led by Ottoman speaking uh, Turks. Robson's, or at least Muslims. Robson's account, however, because it's so focused on the question of violence, simply, it seems to me, threatens to make the mashriq the poor man's Balkans, not quite as violent, but nevertheless containing the seeds of a destructive communalism and sectarianism that the Europeans would ruthlessly exploit. Now to be fair to Laura, as I've said, she's done an amazing job, a superb job, an excellent job here in this book of dissecting British uh, and French and US imperial uh, hypocrisy and, and colonial brutality. And it, it, she's extremely candid about this brutality and about the violence of colonial Zionism and its relentless and ongoing project to transform what had been a multi-religious Ottoman Arab land into an exclusively Jewish state for which as everyone today knows or should know, the Palestinian Arab majority was expelled and ethnically cleansed in 1948. And in fact, um, well after that point. Robson, again, to her credit, does not deny any of this. And in fact, this is a central aspect of her argument. She repeats time and again how 1948, the year of the Nakba, shattered the Mashriq. And, and of course, it leads me to ask, why is 1939 one of the key dates, not 1948? Because it's really 1948 that's this key, key date by the logic and, and the narrative of her own book. The issue for me uh, comes back again and again to, the, to this abstract conceptual lens of territoriality and mass violence that tends to flatten, it seems to me at times, perhaps inevitably, essential differences between different nationalist figures, such as David Ben-Gurion uh, and Sata al-Husari, as if there's not a, a huge and profound difference, uh, ethical, political, and social differences between a settler colonial project devised in Europe by European Jewish Zionists who would imbibe a thoroughly racialized view of the world and whose entire project was to build an exclusively Jewish state in Palestine and which depended entirely and utterly on British and then US power um, um, as opposed to an Ottoman um, Arab secular nationalist and anti-colonialist who was trying to build a cohesive state that could transcend sectarian differences. Now, perhaps both are intolerant, but they're intolerant in very different ways, it seems to me. And, and I wonder to what extent a, a notion like mass violence uh, or territoriality can actually help clarify as opposed to obscure these differences. I suppose my question here is what is gained and what is lost by describing Israel on the one hand, and then Syria, Iraq, and Lebanon as all, quote, post-colonial governments, um, as Laura does in her book, does it not obscure the crucial differences um, that she is so attentive to in other aspects of her book? And what about the, the, the argument that she does make very powerfully about the causal relationship between colonial violence um, and post-colonial violence in the Arab Mashriq, even if we accept and agree, and I do agree with her, that this is a world that is not being decolonized. In what sense is, is Israel a post-colonial state as opposed to a colonizing state, given what we are witnessing today in the West Bank, East Jerusalem, and the Golan Heights? Does it matter? Uh, whereas Robson is correct to note Israel's relationship to the Palestinians is principally a violent relationship of colonizer and colonized, it seems to me difficult to state that all post-colonial states uh, in the region, in other words, Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and Jordan, 
have relied, as she says, quote, almost solely on a monopoly of violence to legitimate their politics. Um, so in other words, unlike Western colonialism, nationalism in the third world, including in the Arab world, is, is surely more than simply a relationship of violence. It's also obviously about the construction of imagined communities and then about an often ambivalent culture of inclusion. There are limits, taboos, contradictions, flaws, and of course, violence. But there's something beyond simply mass violence, as Franz Fanon noted decades ago in his seminal work on the subject. The last question that I end here uh, in this very, as I said, an, an intriguing, a, a rich book, a book that has provoked me uh, and, um, and from which I learned uh, a, a lot. The last question is perhaps the most difficult, uh, and it's the one that Robson, Robson has not um, actually addressed, but Fanon did. And so let me take this advantage of my intervention here to ask Laura, is violence ever legitimate? Because I mean, it's a very, her book is a very powerful criticism of state violence and state brutality, but is state violence ever legitimate? This is of course a hugely difficult, controversial, vexed question. Is it ever ethical? Fanon's brilliant description of both the colonizer's violence and the colonized response and the pitfalls of national consciousness, as he called it, makes it very clear that analysis and empathy of the colonized are not antithetical endeavors. Is all violence the same? Is Israeli colonial violence, for example, the same as Palestinian anti-colonial violence? Is Kurdish violence the same as Saddam Hussein's pathological regime's violence? At what point does the colonizer's sectarianization create effects on the ground that can't be ignored? and how to combat these legacies. Robson is incredibly attentive to the hugely negative role that Western colonial violence has played in shaping the region and in unmaking a once rich world of coexistence. The tragedy is that, as Robson also notes, the US still plays an enormously damaging role and yet the American public barely registers the Middle East uh, as anything except as a problem, a place of violence and fanaticism, a place without culture or even people. This book, I hope, will go some way to addressing at least some of these illusions. And for that, I think I want to thank Laura for writing this book, and I appreciate this opportunity to comment on it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Osama, for these very thoughtful and provocative comments. Um, I'd like to give Laura a chance to respond immediately and have a bit of back and forth uh, uh, with Osama, if you'd like. So Laura, over to you. Please unmute yourself. Thanks so much, Osama, for your really profoundly thoughtful commentary. I'd like to, I think I'd like to start with something that only gradually became clear to me as I was writing this book. And I was thinking about what it was for. You asked the question of what is gained and lost, you know, when you think about when you use this lens of mass violence. Um, and of course, it does invite the kind of foregrounding and privileging of certain kinds of political narratives and certain kinds of authority and certain kinds of exercise of power. And one of the questions that has come up as I've been kind of discussing this book with, with other people is this question of agency, right? And the question of, you know, what happens? What about all these countervailing currents? What about, you know, movements of anti-colonial solidarity? What about anti-sectarian movements? What about all of the kind of, you know, cultural expressions of coexistence um, and, and political collaboration and political reimagining to which you're referring. And I think that one of the things I wanted to point out here is the extent to which what is perceived as the failures of those movements. And I do think that that is how people understand it, right? That, that movements like the Intifada, for instance, have failed, right? That they have failed in their endeavors. And I wanted to understand, you know, what is it, what is it that causes those kinds of failures? And I think that one of the crucial things that we gain when we think about mass violence as the analytical lens here is that we begin to see where and how that kind of political agency ends. And that physical brutality is actually a way to stop that kind of political activism. It's an effective way. 
it's a successful way. And it's something that we don't acknowledge often enough. And this is actually not just about the Middle East. I think we could make, we could make very similar commentaries about modern American history. We can make similar commentaries about other post-colonial spaces around the globe um, that, you know, movements of inter communal solidarity of liberation, even of, of, of kind of national reimaginings have, have very often failed, not because they don't have a vision for what a future state might be able to look like, what a new political society might be able to look like, but because they have been actively crushed by physical violence. And what it's really one of the things that I wanted to point out here is exactly when and how that has operated. And that the purpose of that is to demonstrate that these, these movements failures aren't due to some kind of intellectual or political or cultural collapse, right? But that they have been actively destroyed purposefully, deliberately, and repeatedly. Um, and I do think that that is something that we, that, that even within the context of Middle East studies, we have sort of very often failed to understand and that we have focused in on rhetoric and discourse to some extent at the expense of understanding the actual mechanisms of power and particularly how that's operated with regard to external interventions from the European colonial period up to the present. So I think that's kind of one thing, one thing that I would say about what we can gain from this. And I think that it does involve a kind of flattening of the movements that um, that are at the kind of, you know, held at gunpoint, right? Um, but it also helps us to understand how and why and where they have disintegrated or disappeared, and that that's not an accidental process, but a deliberate one. In terms of the question of types of violence, I think that this is this is something this is something actually that genocide studies as a field has also wrestled with, right? Does it matter to a victim, for instance, um, you know, what type of violence he, he or she was at the receiving end of? Um, and it's a, very, it's a very difficult question, and it's not a question that I think I have a definitive answer to. I do want to say that I think that the placing of Israel within the panoply of post-colonial states is an important one, and I could not agree more that Israel is a colonial state. I, I, I want to be very clear about that. Um, and But I think that part of my critique here is to say that Israel has very often imagined itself as a nonviolent state. I think that continues up to the present against all the available evidence, right? And that by placing it against these other post-colonial states that also struggle with the question of how to exercise what is kind of often seen as fundamentally illegitimate political power, we can see some of the mechanisms by which Israel is not a democratic state, is in fact operating on colonial principles that it inherited from its predecessors in some of the same ways that the modern authoritarian states of places like Syria and Iraq have done. And that that's actually a very, I, I think that is one of the most important correctives I see myself as making in this book, that we need to see Israel as part of this kind of violent ferment of ethno-nationalism that emerges throughout the 20th century, that Israel is not fundamentally different, right? It is, it is exercise, except in that it is exercising colonial rule over another population, right? In, in more overt ways, in more violent ways um, than is true for some of the other other states under discussion, but it's not, it's not more democratic. Um, it is not less reliant on the type of colonial violence that it has inherited, and that we need to understand that story as one that is deeply, deeply integrated into the broader history of the colonial and post-colonial Middle East, and that we really, that's, that's work that has not yet been done. Your question about Fana is, is equally you know, a, a very difficult one. And I don't think I have an answer. I will say, I, I don't think I want to commit myself to a political position on this, but I will say that across the course of writing this book, I have always been 
sympathetic to Fennel as a writer and a thinker, and that sympathy grew in the course of writing this book. Um, and that I think it's worth taking his positions about the differentiations between colonial and anti-colonial violence and the kind of potential what he what he thinks of as a kind of the creativity, the possible creativity of of anti colonial violence. It's worth taking that philosophical position seriously. Um, I don't know what that looks like when we carry it forward into the realm of policy and action. But I think it might be worth bringing back into the conversation and I do actually think that is starting to happen in in realms kind of both within and beyond Middle East studies. So I think I'll leave it there. Thank you so much for what was an incredibly thoughtful and provocative set of comments. Great, thanks. Usama, any immediate response to Laura? Otherwise, we'll go to Layla. I mean, I have, but I'll, I'll just, it's, I, can, I can pursue these with her uh, later. No, it's, I mean, if it's, if it's I mean, a- let's, if I'd it's like a, to listen to what Layla has to say. Okay, um, excellent. We back and we'll go on, then, then we'll bring Layla into the conversation. Thank you. Um, Delighted now to introduce uh, Dr. Leila Parsons, who is Professor of Modern Middle East History at McGill University. She is the author of The Druze Between Palestine and Israel, 1947 to 1948, published in 2000, and numerous articles on the 1948 war, on rebel soldiers and the interwar period, and on the place of narrative and biography in the historiography of the modern Middle East. Her most recent book, the commander, Fauzi al Kabukji, uh, and the fight for Arab independence, 1914 to 1948, published in 2016, was the recipient of the 2017 Palestine Book Award and the Society for Military History's 2017 Distinguished Book Award. She's currently writing a book on British occupation of Palestine, 1917 to 1948. Leila, welcome to the Washington History, History Seminar. Floor is yours. Thank you so much. And thank you to Christian and Eric for inviting me. And I'm uh, very happy to be here today with my two respected colleagues, uh, Laura and Osama. Uh, Laura, congratulations uh, for the book. This is a very ambitious project. Uh, you're attempting to offer a clear explanation for why there has been violence in the history of the Eastern Middle East from the end of the 19th century until today. If we imagine a similar book on the history of Europe with the title, The Politics of Mass Violence in Europe, we can get a comparative sense of the nature of the challenge. Europe in the 20th century saw close to 100 million killed in warfare, ethnic cleansing and genocide. To write a book that not only narrates that violence but also attempts to explain it would be a formidable challenge. So just to give the viewers a sense of the challenge here. I'm just gonna pull out what I took to be three key messages of the book. And I'm quite happy to hear uh, Laura um, describe um, her own view of the message of her own book. And, and it definitely overlaps with my reading of it. Um, and I'll be probably also repeating a little bit some of the things that Osama said. The first and perhaps most important message is that contrary to what we, what we could call popular opinion in the US or what we read in the newspapers, there's nothing inherent or endemic about violence in the Middle East. We do not see violence there because Middle Easterners have a violent culture or because of age old religious hatreds, either between different religions in the Middle East or between different sects within Islam, the obvious example being Sunnis and Shiites. Rather, you're arguing, Laura, that we need to understand the violence in the Middle East as a modern 20th, 20th and 21st century phenomenon. According to you, violence in the Middle East is due to processes in the modern era that are connected to a number of historical changes, such as Ottoman centralization, European colonial conquest and occupation, the emergence of the nation state and Cold War politics. So that's in a way the most important message that I took away from the book. The second message concerns the place of Israel um, in this history of Middle Eastern violence. And here I'm gonna be adding to what you were just saying, Laura, um, about your treatment of Israel in this book. You're careful to recognize the particular violence of Israel's birth when you say at the end of chapter four, and I quote, 
There is no question that the 1948 war forever changed the political landscape of the modern Middle East and that the sudden and violent imposition of a European settler state in the midst of a 20th century wave of decolonization across the Middle East was a trauma with few precise global parallels. But at the same time, you're arguing that Israel is not special or exceptional in the context of the region's history. This leads to a historical narrative that is organized in a new way. You know, we see a lot of stories that we read quite a lot in narrative histories of the Middle East, but the way that you've organized the material is completely new. Where in the same chapters, we have accounts of Arab state violence and Israeli state violence, violence analyzed alongside one another. Let's just take chapter six as an example. In chapter six, you have a long section on the Israeli invasion of Lebanon in 1982 and the killing of close to 20,000 civilians, followed by a long section on Saddam Hussein's murderous campaign against the Kurds, where just in the period of the Anfal alone in 1988, close to 70,000 were killed. And you analyze these two events in relation to one another, showing how both the Iraqi state and the Israeli state were using violence first and foremost as a means to enforce territoriality, to delineate the borders of sovereignty as fundamentally unchallengeable. The way that you integrate Israeli violence into a broader narrative of the history of violence in the Middle East is new, as I've said, and it's new for two completely different audiences. For a mainstream non-specialist audience, the book offers a new account of Israel by saying, Israel is not especially good. It is not a struggling de democratic state just trying to defend itself against Arab violence, in quotation marks. Rather, it is part of the 20th century processes in the region that have led to so much violence. But for the more specialist Middle East studies academic audience, you are saying Israel is not especially bad. It is not the cause of all the violence in the Middle East, but rather just one um, of many causes. The third message that jumped out at me is related to the history of nonviolent resistance in the region. You show in detail how the colonial powers before 1948 and the international community since 1948 have done nothing substantial to try to encourage the emergence of political change through peaceful means in the Middle East. And one of the most poignant examples you give of this is in chapter seven, where you narrate the history of the first Palestinian Intifada at the end of the 1980s which was an explicitly nonviolent mass mobilization against Israeli military occupation. You show how the international community turned a blind eye as Israel used the old British colonial tactic of systematic collective punishment in order to crush Palestinian efforts towards effecting change through peaceful means. And because my own current book project is on the history of British colonial occupation of Palestine between 1917 and 1948, I've been spending a lot of time working with the archival material that documents the British Army's brutal suppression of the 1936 to 39 Palestine revolt. And it's striking how many tactics the Israeli army lifted 50 years later, straight from the British to crush Palestinian resistance in the first intifada. So you describe how the failure of the first intifada to effect change for Palestinians living under Israeli law, rule ultimately suggested to Palestinians and to a broader Arab audience that nonviolence was unproductive and perhaps even counterproductive as a mode of resistance against a brutal military occupation. Again, your audience here seems to be a mainstream audience in the US. As you put it in the book, and I'm quoting, the question of why there was no Palestinian Gandhi has long been at the heart of the critique of the Palestinian cause in the US. This really rang true for me in particular. When I was an assistant professor at one US university in the early 2000s, teaching the history of the Arab-Israeli conflict, well-meaning colleagues in other fields like American history would take me out to lunch and the conversation would inevitably turn to whichever crisis was then breaking out in Israel-Palestine. These colleagues would often say to me, I just don't understand why the Palestinians don't practice nonviolent resistance. Why hasn't there been a Palestinian Gandhi? And it drove me absolutely crazy, I have to say, how often this happened. 
but I would patiently explain each time that the Palestinians had repeatedly tried to organize and sustain campaigns of nonviolent resistance, first during the period of British rule and more recently during the first intifada, but that in every instance, this nonviolent resistance had been brutally crushed, first by the British army and then by the Israeli army. And all the while, the international community looked on and did nothing of any real consequence. So what message are the Palestinians supposed to draw from that? So I have a bunch of questions, but I know we're getting um, a little close. You know, we, we want to leave time for um, a Q&A and for the audience to ask questions. So I'll just ask a couple of my questions. Um, and the first one relates to this issue of the choice um, to write about violence in the Middle East. And in a sense, it connects um, with one of Osama's um, critiques of the book. So as we've established, one of the main aims of the book is to show that violence in the Middle East cannot be proper, properly understood through simplistic explanations of atavistic ethnic hatred. But Laura, you're still choosing to write a book about violence in the Middle East, which some would argue could add strength to the misleading and essentializing discourse around the Middle East in the US, a discourse that casts the Middle East as an especially rough neighborhood. And as I said at the outset of my comments, the scale of violence seen in Europe in the 20th century is so much greater than in the Middle East. But you obviously made a choice not to be even more broadly comparative. You chose to restrict your analysis to the states in the mushroom. So on the one hand, your aim is to say that violence is not endemic to the Middle East, but on the other hand, you're publishing a book called Politics of Mass Violence in the Middle East. This is something of a conundrum. And I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about how you dealt with this conundrum as you were conceptualizing and writing the book. And here I'm asking a slightly different question from Assem. I'm really asking about, you know, how did you think about the effects of this book? Um, the second question is that you start the book, as you just pointed out in your presentation, with a quote from Michelle Aflac, the well-known Syrian political theorist who is considered one of the founders of Ba'athism. And you say that for Aflac, political violence had a purpose, to remake the world, to clarify the true nature of a society, to purify not just movements, but individuals. Now, given that Aflac was a key political philosopher, this opening made me think that you were going to make political ideology and the kind of intellectual backdrop for the violence that you discuss in the book, a kind of key explanatory factor. But in fact, the book hardly discusses ideology at all. Um, and I'd, I'd like to ask you why, why did you make that choice um, to, to not give time, extensive time in the book um, to the issue of ideology? But thank you very much, Laura. Just like a sermon, I found the book very provocative and um, it made me think I enjoyed reading it and it's an important contribution. Thanks so much, Leila. Um, there may be time later on for some of the other questions, but let's give Laura a chance to respond. Laura? Thanks so much, Leila, for a really thoughtful set of commentary. Um, I. There's so much that could be said about this. I, I want to. I, I think I want to directly address your first question first, which is, you know, why focus in on mass violence, right? And you're absolutely right. And I think this is actually worth saying that, statistically speaking, the Middle East across the 20th century was a much less violent place than Europe, right? Um, and that's a point that I make in the introduction, um, but it's one that is worth reiterating that this kind of public perception of the Middle East as an especially violent place in kind of modern world history is not borne out by the facts and the numbers and the kind of, you know, grim statistics that scholars of mass violence bandy about. So it is worth actively stating that kind of again and again. That said, it is nevertheless true that the experience of mass violence has been at the heart of many individuals and communities political experiences across the metric in the 20th and 21st centuries. And I think that one of the reasons that I wanted to think about that phenomenon was 
that when you actually come down to thinking, writing, what are, what are the politics of mass violence, right? Who are the perpetrators? What does this actually look like for populations on the ground? That one of the things that comes up is that the perpetrators are often external, right? And that when we talk about mass violence in the Middle East, what we're actually very frequently talking about is mass violence that is inflicted upon the Middle East. So I wanted to make that especially clear. And I don't think that it serves anybody's intellectual or political interests to pretend that violence hasn't been a constitutive part of the political experience. And that as historians, you know, we do need to understand why this has been. And that the real answer to this has much more to do with the 20th century than the Middle East, right? And that it, and, and one of the other kind of takeaways that I, I hope this book points towards, and I hope that other scholars will, will pick up on, is that the Middle East as a colonized and sort of semi-post-colonial space has a great deal in common with other parts of the globe. Um, and that that history, that history of violence can help us to understand the toxicity with which empires have operated. And also I think the toxicity of the nation state. I'm a little bit skeptical about claims of the kind of potentially liberationist um, goals and outcomes of a national state. And I think that this is, this is one of the things that ties the history of the Middle East to those of other parts of the world that we can see that actually national enterprises have very often been bound up with issues of and practices of violence and the kind of installation of violence at the heart of state authority. And the Middle East is part of that 20th century history, um, even though it is by no means the most dramatic example. So I think that's that that's kind of what I would begin to say about why why do this project why focus in on this question. The issue of ideology is is kind of linked in some respects is that as I began to think about this project and look at the examples, I think that the use of mass violence is so frequently a colonial and neo-colonial use that ideology actually has relatively little to do with it, right? That the ideological backing um, is ex post facto in some respects, um, that it is not at the heart of why and when and how that violence is actually deployed, that we can find instances of kind of an ideological justification for mass violence in some moments, but that it's actually not particularly relevant to the moments where that mass violence is actually operative. So, it's another case, I think, of the way that we have had a tendency to allow discourse and rhetoric to take precedence over physicality and geography. Um, and, and I think that we actually do, this is something that's probably worth discussing in kind of a broader frame, the extent to which the ideological language and discourse surrounding the question of the use of violence as a tool of occupation or as a tool of liberation is meaningful. Um, it's a very big question and one that could extend well beyond the Middle East. Um, but, I, but I came to the conclusion in my own survey of the 20th and 21st centuries that it hasn't been the primary mobilizing factor. So I think I'll, there's much more that could be said of course, but I think I'll, I'll close there for the moment and perhaps we can open up to further discussion. Great, thanks so much, Laura. Before um, I open up uh, questions to, uh, from, to questions from the audience, and again, you can use the raise, raise hand function, uh, the Q&A function, or email to um, get in touch with us. We prefer the raise hand function because then we can bring you and your voice into the conversation, um, but any of these three are fine. Um, before I before we do that, though, let me ask Laura, could you talk a little bit about the sources um, for your book, the uh, sources you've used? Um, yeah. So this is primarily a book that is not archival, right? It is mostly based on secondary literature and serves as a kind of synthesis of some of the political narratives. And, you know, there's been a, an explosion of excellent scholarship um, from the Ottoman period on um, over the past 20 years. And in some ways, I mean, a kind of secondary purpose of the book was to bring some of those 
individual scholarly endeavors in conversation with each other. Um, so it is mainly based on secondary sources and particularly on, I think one of the, one of the main kind of scholarly um, sets of sources that I made use of in the beginning was the new Ottoman scholarship that links the Balkan Wars and the rise of the CUP and the First World War to the, the, the colonial period, right? That begins to challenge the kind of um, sharp demarcation between late, the late Ottoman state and the early European colonial state. So in terms of sources, I think I would point to that as a particularly important set of kind of secondary source inspirations for the, for the book. Great, thank you. Well, let's bring in some questions from the audience. Um, David Rabinovitz um, writes, I'm wondering about the difference between mass violence and active war. The Palestinian refugees are refugees from the 1948 Arab-Israeli war, a war which has never formally ended with the continued actions of Hezbollah, Hamas, and the Intifadas being continuing battles in that war. Can the status of war refugees be resolved while the war is still active and some of the refugees are active participants in that war? This is a common question in genocide studies and scholars of genocide and ethnic cleansing have very often pointed out that episodes of mass violence, episodes of ethnic cleansing, episodes of genocide are vastly more likely within the context of war. That does not mean that they are limited to the context of war or that we should understand them as, as somehow explained and justified by a framework of warfare. So I think that we could, I, I think it's I think it's a bit difficult to make the case that um, there is you know that that the kind of mass violence that has taken place on the part of the Israeli state has has been taking place within the context of a decades long explicit war. Um, I think there are people who would make such a claim, but I would say that that is incorrect. Um, and, but I think that we also need to understand that conditions of warfare, conditions of conflict make crimes against humanity more likely. Um, and that the kind of framework of a moment of war can make possible the envisioning of dramatic and violent quote unquote solutions to the problems that war is presenting um, that don't arise as frequently in peacetime. Thank you. And uh, Leila and Usama, feel free to, to chime in as well as, as, you, as you like. Um, Can I just chime in on sure. that question? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, I think it's, it's not the most productive frame to think about it as an ongoing war because war implies a certain equality between the two sides, two nation states at war with one another. Um, and I do think that, um, you know, the settler colonial frame is a much more appropriate frame for understanding um, violence between Israelis and Palestinians. I mean, this is a case of um, a settler colonial state continuing to colonize um, up until this day um, and with no seemingly no intention of stopping to do so. Um, so war doesn't really capture um, the violence that's unfolding as far as I'm concerned. Um, and I think it's a misleading, a misleading analytical frame. Thank you. Question from Stephen Shore. Where do American and Soviet Russian roles in the Middle East fit in with the recolonization interpretation? In the post-1945 era, you know, the US took on many of the roles in the Middle East that had prior to that date um, been occupied by the British Empire. And it did so in a slightly less direct, but nevertheless effective manner um, by establishing economic and resource domination over various countries in the region. And particularly as we get into the 1970s and 1980s by kind of identifying client leaders and communities um, within states like Iraq and Syria as, as partners, and, and the state of Israel, of course, as well, as partners in the kind of American imperial project that could remain officially unstated, but nevertheless be a, be a kind of effective mode of governance. The Soviet, the Soviet interest is, is a more equivocal story. Um, the Soviet Union was 
uncomfortable to say that this is a story that also plays out in other um, other post-colonial settings. It was uncomfortable with many of the kind of nationalist frames in which that 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 Arab governments in the post colonial period were, were making use of. And so support was often was present, um, involvement was present and particularly and dramatically um, in the case of the Soviet war in Afghanistan. Um, but it was it was always tempered by kind of uncertainty about the degree of commitment that the Soviet leadership wanted to make um, to this part of the world. So I think it ends up being largely a story of American empire um, and that that is that really becomes kind of dramatically evident in the 1990s and then especially of course um, since 2003. Thank you. Osama, I'm sorry you're, you had your hand raised. Um, uh, you, the screen was covered, your part of the screen was covered when I was reading those questions. So go ahead. Well, just a quick question, follow up to Laura. I mean, to Laura's point. Um, so it seems to me there is, is there? A, I mean, on the one hand, you you keep using the phrase post-colonial uh, and a post-colonial world, a post-colonial states, and then at the same time, you said over and over again, with which I actually agree that it's still a colonized world, or you called it semi-colonial or semi-decolonized. And it seems to me it's either this or it's that. It can't be both. Or if it is both, how do you account for that? And, and how does that sort of, when you're addressing a Western audience that has no conception of, of, of this colonized world or a semi-colonized world for that matter, how do, you, how do you address that contradiction? And doesn't that in fact undercut the argument of saying that Israel is like, like the violence of the Ba'athist state is like the violence. I mean, of course they're happening parallel. These are states that are all now side by side and they commit different acts of violence against the people under their sovereign control or under their control. Uh, but fundamentally, one actually is still part of a colonial realm that you've described, and the other one is a are, are somehow, as you said, semi-colonized or semi-decolonized. It, it's like you can't have, how can we have both? And if both, isn't this what has to be elaborated a little bit more? Because this is not the normal Eurocentric scholarship doesn't talk about these things. Yeah, it's an excellent point, actually. And I think you're pointing to a real problem in the language that we have to talk about, um, you know, 20th and 21st century politics more generally. Um, so I, I mean, I, I, I think you're right. I think that we need a new term to describe what these states after 1945 that fall into this kind of American neo-imperial sphere look like. Um, they're not formally colonized, right, in the sense that we don't have, well, <laughs> even in this sense, I was going to say that they don't have an occupying army, but of course, in many cases, they actually do. Um, so I, I, I suppose recolonial would be a potentially useful word, but it's something that as a scholarly community, we should think about, right? Perhaps we need a new term um, to talk about, to talk about, to make this differentiation. And I think it's, I think it's, it's actually pointing to a broader problem in the scholarship and in our understanding as well, which is that as, when, as soon as we use the terms like independent, right? That we are describing something that is not a political reality. And that we really have not acknowledged that explicitly. And you're pro you're right that this book probably doesn't go far enough towards you know remaking the language in that respect. So perhaps it's it's a kind of call to arms that you know scholars need to be thinking about what kinds of states these are and how to differentiate between them. Um, I think that you know we can we can certainly make the case that Israel's occupation of the territories is actively colonial in the old sense of the word. Um, and that I think that's that is actually a useful frame to think about that particular model. Um, I think it's more complicated to think about Israel's relationship with its own citizens, which falls much more um, under the rubric of the kind of what I've I've said as post-colonial, but recolonial re um, state uh, along the model of the other Arab nation states in the in the post-1945 Middle East. Mm. So it's it's an excellent point. I hope that other scholars will take this up. Maybe we sh we need a new language um, to describe these political phenomena. Mm. Thank you. David Rothwell writes, the Western audience may not understand rhetoric and discourse that occurs in 30 plus varieties of Arabic that are filtered by the author's perceptions and the audience's preoccupations. Do you appreciate the concern? Mm 
I mean, I think every part of the world is complicated with languages and regions and local specificities and that, you know, we don't seem to have a problem as Leila pointed out in understanding the political landscape of Europe in that same way, and that we should apply the same kind of intellectual effort to delineating the differentiations within the Arab world. Um, and I think this is a matter of, of effort, essentially, and that there have been, you know, there have been reasons in kind of media coverage to flatten down the Arab world. I think actually this is, this is part of the rhetoric that the Israeli state has made use of, right, um, is to suggest that there is a kind of equivalency and sameness among Arab populations across the Middle East. Um, and that's the, those kinds of assumptions um, need to be challenged. And that I, I think that I, I actually think it is possible to make the effort to do that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Glenn Marcus writes, while behavior in the occupied territories and Gaza is highly problematic, Otherwise, can Israel proper be called undemocratic when voting rights exist for 20% of Israelis who are of Arab extraction? Yes, I think it can. Um, I So there, there are a few different issues to kind of parse out here. One is that formal citizenship for Arab Israelis is by no means equal citizenship. Um, so there are mechanisms, I think, Israel, Israel in its post-1948 development um, constructed procedurally democratic ways to maintain ethnic hierarchies. And that's actually true even within the Jewish communities of the state of Israel, where Ashkenazi Jews occupied nearly all of the important political positions in the years after 1948 for many decades, um, where Mizrahi Jews who came into the state of Israel in the 1950s from places like Yemen or Iraq um, were treated at the very least as second class citizens for a very long time, um, that these kinds of striations and hierarchies even within Israel's Jewish population have been have been made into structural elements of the state. Um, so I think that that's an aspect of Israel's relationship with democratic governance that we can't ignore. Um, and that's not even beginning to get into the question of the relationship of Arab Israelis to a state that is increasingly, um, I think, especially in recent years, intent on defining itself as excluding them as a, as a part of the national body. But I also want to point out, it is not possible to think about Israel without thinking about the occupation. The occupation has been going on since 1967. It shows no signs of ending. There is no even rhetorical effort at, you know, pointing towards some kind of end of this, of, of this military campaign. I don't think it's a legitimate political analysis to say, oh, we can set this issue aside and think about what Israel looks like within its 1948 borders. This is a state that has been committed to this occupation for a very long time. And we have to see that occupation as part of its internal governance. And I think that's a, that's a really crucial point that we must make in the public sphere. Thank you. I'd like to call on uh, John Martin, if uh, you can please unmute yourself, John Martin. And please yes. introduce yourself to, to the panelists. Laura and all of you, terrific discussion. It sounds like a wonderful book. I'm a, a retired network television correspondent, covered middle, the Middle East in and out in the 70s and 80s mostly. I just have a question for Laura. You say it's not an archival book, but do you have any sources with television news coverage of events in the Middle East? 
It's a good question. I did use a bit of media coverage, particularly for the most recent events. Um, so the last chapters of the book deal with the post 2003 landscape. Um, and so I did it for which, you know, this is this is a story that historians kind of broadly speaking have yet to write. Um, so I did rely on journalistic accounts of of some of those those narratives. Um, and it's that's that's in itself a kind of interesting thing for historians to be doing, right? It's something I was I was nervous about, but actually I think it's useful to think about the relationship between journalism and historical writing, um, especially in the frame of contemporary developments. Mm. May, I send you a may I send you a catalog of some of those stories and see if there would be interest sure. in you? Sure, I, absolutely. I would be very interested to see that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. Thank you, John. I'd like to call on Benjamin Tua. Please unmute yourself. And please introduce yourself to the panelists. Thank you very much. I'm a retired uh, American diplomat. I served in the Middle East, uh, specifically in Israel. And my question is about the recent past and the near to medium uh, future in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, namely, how have the Abraham Accords changed and are likely to change the dynamics of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict in the short and medium term? And this uh, question is for any or all of the panelists. happy to answer, but if Leila or Osama would like to go ahead, then. Go, go ahead, Laura. Go ahead, Laura. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I think that <laughs> one of the lessons that I have taken away from this research and writing this book is that these kinds of accords and negotiations have in fact had very little impact on the ground um, in nearly all instances. You know, it's it's interesting. I used to, when I taught my Arab Israeli class, I when I first started teaching it, I used to make frequent use of diplomatic primary sources for students to read and go through kind of, you, you know, UN resolutions and the accords and the various agreements that had been come to at different moments at, at, and times. Um, and I have stopped doing that, partly because I have come to believe that the actual narrative events in Israel-Palestine unfolds primarily at the level of force. Um, and that these kinds of diplomatic negotiations represent very little more than window dressing. Um, so I think that I think that when we think about the kinds of accords that 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 have been arrived at, um, we need to think about the power dynamics that have produced them and the particular individuals who have participated in them and what their interests in the process are. And that by coming down to specificities, we can begin to get a clearer sense of the kind of architecture of power um, and the, the, the sorts of directions that that might point to in the future. Um, I would have to say that I, I I'm not left optimistic at this particular moment in time. Can I just add one one uh, sure. thing to Laura's answer? I think if you know there's one effect, it might be actually bringing more unity to the Palestinians. Um, there have been recent talks between Hamas and Fatah. Um, there are upcoming elections. Um, uh, for the Palestinians, and I think this is partly a reaction to the perception on the Palestinian side of the betrayal by the UAE um, in these accords um, of, of, of the Palestinian cause. So I think there is going to be some kind of realignment um, between the Palestinians and um, the Arab states, obviously particularly the Arab states in the Gulf, um, from these accords which could have interesting effects. But like Laura says, I don't see any hope um, that this is going to bring peace in the Middle East. <laughs> I would also add, I mean, just as a matter of kind of, you know, public perception, the idea that Israel has had relationships with and interests in the Gulf 
is not a new idea. I mean, people are people are have been familiar with these these kinds of backstage negotiations for a very long time. This comes as no surprise to anybody who's been watching. Um, so I, I I don't think that it's it's not some kind of breakthrough. You know, it's it's something that's building on political patterns that have been present for a long time, and that that Palestinians and other observers in the Arab world have been well aware of for for some years. Mm. Thank you. There's a question from Adam Martin that actually cuts sort of in the in a little bit in the same direction. Is it fair to say that the peace agreement between Israel and Egypt helped to reduce uh, Middle Eastern violence? If so, what could we learn from that agreement? If not, why not? I think it's probably telling that that agreement came about um, in the context of a very conservative and kind of territorially ambitious Israeli administration, and that the kind of separate peace that was that was agreed on between Israel and Egypt, in, in a way, again, probably doesn't come as a surprise um, to observers at the time, but represents represented at the time and kind of continues to represent today a chipping away of Palestinian leverage um, in, in their own negotiations with the with 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 Israel and with the international community. So I mean it speaks to the broader point, right, which is that the Palestinian experience um, is not necessarily a unifying factor around the Arab world in quite the way it can be rhetorically in some moments, but in quite the way that we have understood. So I would say that no, it has did not lead to a, a reduction in mass violence um, and that we should understand it as a strategic move um, on the part of both the Israeli and the Egyptian governments and not one that was kind of essentially directed at some kind of peaceful resolution of the situation. Thank you. Um, question from Robert uh, Heyer. Um, the Middle East is a colonized uh, area, you say, yet it has been trampled uh, for thousands of years. What are the driving purposes for Europe and US to go into the area? Christianity, oil, question mark, big questions that are, you know, go, go well beyond the scope of the book in a way, but uh, here we are. I mean, I think it's been different things at different moments. Um, you know, the, the British and French imperial interests in the Middle East were driven certainly partly by oil, even at an early stage. That was, that was clearly a, a major factor, for instance, in the British invasion of what they called Mesopotamia in the First World War. Um, the French had longstanding commercial interests in Lebanon and Syria. Um, it is, you know, it was considered strategically important for the rest of both the British and the French Empire. In the post-1945 era, American interests have also been multifarious. I mean, I think oil has certainly been one of the major interests, but it's not the only one. There are strategic interests. There are many, many military, American military bases across the Middle East. Um, so there are, it, it's, it's a combination of factors, I think. Um, and the question of where Christianity plays a role is also relevant. I think it has, you know, the invention, the Protestant invention of the idea of the Holy Land as a destination for European travelers in the 19th century is an idea that may not have been a primary driving force in the practice of, of European and American imperialism through the 20th century, but has certainly been a source of rhetorical and discursive strength and support for those projects. Um, so that's that's not an irrelevant factor either. But I also think, I mean, any any explanation that goes across, you know, thousands or hundreds or even decades of, you know, tens of years, you know, there there is no overriding factor that stays the same over these over these periods of time. I think we need to look specifically at the particularities of the imperial and and neo imperial moment to understand um, and articulate the interests that are being expressed at that particular time by those particular players. Thank you. We're um, just about out of time. I want to give uh, Leila Osama a chance to make any final comments if they wish. Laura, anything, any final comments by anyone? If not, then I'm uh, with thanks to Laura, to Osama, to Leila.
let me turn it over to Eric for some concluding remarks. All right, well, thank you all, Laura, Leila, Asama, and Christian, as well as those of you in the audience. Apologies to those whose questions we get, could, couldn't get to. I suspect we could stay on for quite a bit longer uh, engaging the issues that are raised in this book and that are on people's minds. I invite you to join us next Monday on March 29th at 4 p.m. when the Washington History Seminar returns to discuss Christopher Capazola's Bound by War, How the United States and the Philippines Built the First America, America's First Pacific Century. And in case you just can't get enough of history programming, you can also join the Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program earlier that day, Monday the 29th at 1 p.m., for a session on Philip Zekolo's the Road Less Traveled, The Secret Battle to End the Great War, 1916-1917. And with that, we say good night and take care.